made it. Sorry about that, just a catalogue of errors. But I'm here now, and thank you all for being here too. And, um, you know, at first I thought it was a terrible mistake leaving something back at the lab, but then I realised, you know, it gave me this opportunity to tell you that everyone's journey here was just full of materials, wasn't it? And you may have all ignored them, and that's probably a good thing in some senses, but I never ignore them. I'm a material scientist. I spent my life obsessing about them. And so um, for an hour, I've got you, and I want to just kind of enthuse you too about materials. And so, in fact, not just that, I want to kind of, I want to make the argument that material science, so this, this science that I do and many, many people around the world do, that studies how materials work and invents new materials, this is the key science that we need for the 21st century. And so let's start. Let's see where we get ourselves. And the first thing I want to say, of course, is that here's me in the taxi, and of course I'm waxing lyrical about this material I had to return to the lab to get aerogel. And I'm going to tell you a bit about that in a minute. But, you know, as I pointed out in the cab, the cab itself made of many things. I was wearing, am wearing many things. Um, you know, we just can't do without materials. They are, they are us. They are an expression of who we are. We invented all of these. And the question is, why? Why did we go to all this trouble when nakedness, well, would have been so much easier, wouldn't it? <laughs> and lack of mobile phones and transport and all these things. So just to give you a sense of how it can be that we've invented so many materials, I thought I'd focus on one. I haven't got too much time, and I'd like to focus on glass, partly because aerogel, that material, that wonderful material I'm going to tell you about in a minute, is actually made of glass. So that explains how it came into being. But also just to, just to kind of unravel a bit of where glass came from and how, in fact, this august institution absolutely relied on the invention of glass to be in existence itself that almost all of its inventions and discoveries rely on this material to this day, and that all of your lives without glass would be immensely poorer. So, a whistle stop tour of the history of glass. I'm going to not start with the Egyptians, who were the first to really kind of get the hang of it and to turn sand into, into this translucent material, but with the Romans, because the Romans did something incredible with it. They, they made real objects out of it. They invented this process by which you could take sand, you could add a bit of natron, which is a sort of flux that lowered the melting point. You could then heat it up, put it on a tube, and blow an object into existence. So this is glass blowing the Roman way. And uh, not only did they invent the first transparent vessels, so you can see the liquid inside, which is something we all like, and allows you to glorify and, and be impressed by wine and its clarity and its deep color. But when you do this, you can make very thin bits of glass, and you can flatten them out, and you invent the window. In fact, the Romans invented the window. And when you look at the windows here, and you look around town, you'll see the little squares of window. They, that's, that's the Romans' view. And without glass windows, it would be a much chillier existence in this room today. And wind, wind hose were called wind holes. And they would have had shutters, and they've had um, uh, curtains. So, so there we are, you, know, you, you, get, you get this urge, this aesthetic urge to, to change a material, and then you, you get the enormous architectural um, impact of that material. Now, the Roman Empire collapsed, but, the, but the, the craft of making glass continued in Europe, but the, the real materials experts moved east, so to Korea and to China and to Japan, and their material of choice was not glass, but it was ceramic. And what you're looking at here, I mean, I could talk about porcelain and many other amazing ceramics. And look, if we talk about the 12th century here, we're talking about th this is not a furnace, this is a fire. They're being able to control temperature so well, and the clay. And the magnification there is these, what's called an oil spot tempuru, tempoka bowl. And that is a little crystal growing in a piece of glass, coating the outside of this bowl. So we know that the Chinese knew about glass, they could make glass, they coated their bowls with glass, they glazed things, we, we do that today. It, gives it, uh, it makes it waterproof and it allows it to be much more hard wearing. 
It can be decorative, as you can see here, and it's an incredible technique. But they chose not to drink out of glasses. They chose not to do it. It's not that they didn't know how to do it. They knew how to do it. They chose not to. Now, why? Why was that? No one really knows. But of course, if you go to a Japanese Chinese restaurant and you get given a glass, now it is an interloper, actually, that you know, things like sake are drunk, are drunk out of a ceramic bowl. Um, so this is, a, this is a, an aesthetic thing at its heart, probably. Um, and um, meanwhile, back in Europe, we, have a diff we had a different aesthetic. So you have, you, have, you, have, you have technique and you have a science, but you have aesthetics pushing materials choices. Back in Europe, the so-called Dark Ages were anything but dark, actually. And this is an example of how glass fast forwards through the culture to not just having a window that keeps the wind out and allows light in, but absolutely transforms what it is to worship. So you know, the cathedrals of Europe, these incredible glass cathedrals, are palaces of light. And they're only that because glass making was so good in Europe. It was so sophisticated. And as the colors become more possible, and as the size of glass gets bigger, and as its stability gets bigger, so do these palaces get more impressive. Well, who cares, you might say, one person likes to drink out of something, and someone else likes to worship in a palace of light. It doesn't really make much difference to life. Well, if you have people who know how to make glass, then you can do something incredible, which is this, that I can't see. <laughs> Actually, a lot of humans can't see. And in the past, that was just an affliction. Sooner or later, you would walk home a little bit drunk, fall over in a ditch, and die. And it happened all the time, <laughs> um, I'm afraid. Um, now, the glass makers suddenly realized that actually, if you shaped glass in a certain way, that you could actually correct for people's sight. And glasses were born. And this is amazing. This is an amazing moment in history, because this is, this is, this is changing, this is a bit of changing our decrepitude, changing something about the human body, and compensating for it by a material. Now, this continues from now on. When you look at hospitals now, you look at implants, probably you've all got something that's in you or around you or had or coated you and healed you that is compensating. But this was the first. And, um, and obviously, as a lot of us in this room, without this class, <laughs> Wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be able to do, be very useful. Um, and then as soon as you have glass lenses, well, of course, you can put them two end to end. And this is where science really starts to get impacted by this material, because now you can see the heavens. And this is a depiction of Galileo looking up with a telescope and seeing the moons of Jupiter. Now, you cannot see them with your uh, natural eyesight. It doesn't matter how good your eyesight is. You can have 20-20 eyesight. You are not going to see the moons of Jupiter. No one had ever seen the moon of Jupiter. No human had ever seen them. No animal until this moment. And it's an amazing moment in human consciousness. So first we have the correction of sight, and then we have seeing further, actually understanding that other planets have moons that go around them, all because of glass. Then, of course, what happens next is that uh, you just turn it around and you make a microscope. And this is, in a way, an even bigger moment, because before this moment, people thought, well, you know, there are small little fleas and things that crawl around us, but that's probably the smallest thing around. And you have someone like Robert Hooke, okay, at the Royal Society here, looking down a microscope and seeing all sorts of stuff, stuff he probably didn't want to see, like the purest water was no longer pure, bugs, cells, the whole of biology becomes apparent only because of glass. And in fact, so this is, Royal, this is work done at the Royal Society, 1665. And this, by some chance, is a paper that I published with Buzz Baum, who may be here or not, I'm not sure, and Michael Cohen, our PhD student. And we were looking at the very hairs, Robert Hooke, I haven't realized this until I was writing the lecture. <laughs> we were looking at exactly the same hairs with a much more advanced microscope. And just to, just to make the point that almost all the work that comes through science and comes through places like the Royal Society, through the journals here, adds to the knowledge of the world, is ultimately to do with our ability to look very closely at things. And that started off with the glass lens and the microscope. OK. But Robert Hooke looked at this thing. And now, this was a curiosity of the time, 1665. In fact, the Royal Society um, had some of this stuff. It's called a, a Prince Rupert's Drop. And it was a, this duke. He came with them. And he 
people, the glass makers have known about them, and it's got a very odd property, and I'll show you one. If we move to the visualizer, is that possible? Okay, here is a Prince Rupert's drop. Now, what it is is a piece of, of liquid glass just dropped into a bucket of water, and that's the result. But it has a peculiar property, which the members of the Royal Society investigated here, not in this actual room, because this is not the room they were at the time, but you can imagine the moment, because this is exactly what the Royal Society was for, to demonstrate and to pontificate as to how this could possibly be. Need this pair. Now, the thing that they discovered was that you can hit this with a hammer <laughs> quite hard, and it won't break. Now, experiments being experiments, um, they don't always go according to plan. <laughs> so I'm just going to watch it. I'm just going to put a little bit of protection there in case any fragments come out that way. But you can see this. OK, ready? Gloves. OK. <laughs> but I love the fact that this experiment was done by the Royal Society, and the members of the Royal Society and the fellows and the public were there to see it happen. So we're recreating a moment here. That didn't sound too good, did it? Whoa. Ah. That wasn't meant to happen. <laughs> <laughs> that often must have happened at the time. Um, OK, so that one didn't survive too well, did it? <laughs> Let me just try one more. Is there any nervousness in the front row? Anyone feel anything? No, OK. OK, let's try that again. Of course, they had different hammers then. You can see the point, right? That's quite an impressive thing. But what, what, they put, what, what Hook and the rest of them decided had happened is that when the glass went into the bucket, it cooled on the outside, and that contracted the glass quite, and that created a force, a stress on the outside of the glass. But the inside cooled much more slowly, and so that had a tensile, a tensile set of stresses in it. So you've got the outside with compressive stresses and the inside with tensile stresses. They exactly equal each other out all the way down the piece of glass. So the compressive stress on the outside is what's allowing me to hit it with a hammer, and sometimes not hit it with a hammer. But um, if I was to disturb that ratio, then I should be able to do it by just snapping the end off the tail. And let me see if that works. That should disturb, that should disturb the uh, equilibrium of the stresses. OK. Let's do that in here. Seems a bit uh, okay. So I'm just going to snip off the end, and that should cause it to go. Okay. So all of that, yes, it's a lot. And if you want to see it in slow motion, and of course you do want to see it in slow motion, um, let me just, well, here we go. Uh, OK, let me go. Oh, no, it's not coming up. Why is that? Sorry, let's see. Uh, for some reason, we got the video. OK, I'm not going to show that in slow motion. Uh, OK, back to that. OK. Right. Now, you, so that's 1665. Um, it took quite a while for that to actually turn out to be a useful thing, but that was the glass doors you all walked through. What makes them tough and what makes um, a place like the Royal Society be allowed to have a glass door that won't suddenly shatter on you and to be sure it won't shatter, even when you hit it with your hip and accidentally hit it with your keys, is that it's made of exactly the same thing. It's called toughened glass. It will stand, it will stand hammer blows sometimes. Um, <laughs> and um, in fact, the reason you can drive around safely in cars made of glass windows is for exactly the same reason. So you get these phenomena where people notice early on, 
and then you get the control of that material, and it, it plays out into all our lives. Here's another example of something like that. So this is Newton, again, you know, this heyday of the Royal Society right early on, using a glass prism, and what he's doing is shining white light through it, and he's seeing colours. Now, everyone had seen these before. This was nothing new. People knew that glass produced these sort of rainbow colours. But what was new was, was Newton's explanation. What Newton said was, those colours are not produced inside the glass. Those colours were produced in the sun. And that the sun, rather than being the purveyor of pure white light, is the purveyor of dirty, ugly mixtures, which are reds and yellows and blues and, and all the colours of the rainbow. But when they come to us, they're in a mixture, and we see a mixture, and our eyes interpret it as white light. And what glass is doing is separating it out and showing us that it's a mixture. And you can't do that. You can't have an understanding of light like that without a transparent material that refracts light. You can't have it without glass. So, so much of the discovery, planets, of, of, mi of microorganisms, of how, how me mechanics of works is through glass. And of course, I can't resist also talking about sort of a later 20th century glass innovation of Pyrex glass. Any of you who put glass in the oven these days, you don't do it with any trepidation. You don't think heating it up is suddenly going to cause it to crack. Why? Because it's made of Pyrex glass. What's that? Well, it's glass that has zero expansion coefficient. And that means that as it heats up unevenly at the back of the oven hotter than the front, or because you happen to pour in some cold liquid, some stock, some wine as you're cooking, none of that None of that is going to create unequal stresses that cause it to explode. Why? Because it's got no thermal, and thermal expansion. And that, that allowed test tubes to happen, and allowed all the glassware of chemistry labs to happen. And if you go into any chemistry lab, what do you see? It's full of glass. <laughs> the, the material's brilliant. I mean, you can heat it up, you can collect gases, you can look through it, you can see precipitates, you can see bubbling, you can shape it, you can you know, what, what would that subject be without glass? So, so there we have just an enormous amount of stuff that glass has given us. And if you fast forward to sort of today and you see something like the shard, you might think, well, of course, the Romans invented those big, sh big bits of glass. And of course, you know, it was just a matter of time before maybe someone made a big building that was completely glass. But that's not true. That happened relatively late, actually, in the whole glass thing. And that's because although people like Hook and Newton and everyone else started to understand glass and what it could do, the last thing, the last piece of understanding about glass came much later in the 20th century, which is how, why glass is strong. Because if you don't know why glass is strong, you can't make big bits of it. And actually, it was a real puzzle. But it remained unknown for a while, and we'll go back to that in a minute, because it actually tells you something really important about materials. In the meantime, of course, people were making using glass all sorts of things. Uh, making little fibers of glass, and no one knew what they were for until everyone suddenly wanted to communicate with each other. And then, of course, they shone lasers through them. And this is how all your data goes across the Atlantic, under the sea, uh, between, between your houses now. All your downloads, your Netflix, all over the sky Atlantic is ones and zeros in light going down glass. If it wasn't for glass, you wouldn't have a channel that allows the speed of light travel, and so you wouldn't have what we have now, which is this sort of incredible wealth of data. So that moment in the taxi when I'm holding up aerogel, it, it, it speaks about something else. It's sort of saying, look, glass. You know, glass is, is chemistry. It's telecoms. It's the birth of physics. It's the birth of biology. It's, it's about disability. It's about architecture. And it's about beer. I didn't get a chance to tell you about that <laughs> because um, I haven't had much time. But uh, um, it is about beer, by the way. <laughs> We can talk about it later over a beer. Great. Um, but you're thinking, he still hasn't shown us the aerogel. And that, of course, is an omission which I must rectify. What's the point of going all the way back to the lab if I forget to do that? Uh, can we go to the visualizer? OK. Should have got a dustpan and brush at the same time. OK. Here we go. Now, this material is sort of often called a ghost material because it, 
it's not really there. It's 99.8% air. It's made of glass, but it's a glass foam now. So most of it's air. And if I put it on a black background, you'll see something else very special about it, which is that it's quite hard to tell where it ends and the, and, and, um, and the air begins. But it's got a blue, it looks blue, right? That's not a pigment. That blueness is scattering of the light in this room in the same way that the light scatters in the atmosphere. So in the atmosphere, light scatters, white light, so lots of different colors, <laughs> scatters, and it preferentially scatters blue light. So more blue light gets scattered than the other colors, and you see the sky is blue for that reason. In this material, the holes are just the right size to allow scattering of light, and so it scatters blue more than the other wavelengths, and you see it as blue. I see it as blue, and so therefore this, it being almost completely air, right? It's 99.8% air, and it's scattering light like air. This is as close to a blue sky material as you'll ever get. <laughs> and it really does epitomize everything else that glass has done for us over the years. And that's why, that's why it's so important. It's symbolically important. And that is something the materials do. They are symbols for us. They're not just useful. They're not just comfy. They don't just keep the wind out. They don't just allow us to correct for a disability. They mean something. So what do they mean? We'll get to that in a minute. Can I go back to my slides? First, I promised to tell you about the strength conundrum. And in, in doing so, I need to tell you a bit about how material science has kind of evolved. Um, so, the thing about understanding glass from a kind of physical perspective is like, what is it then? It's like silicon and oxygen. And, and yes, it is. It's silicon and oxygen molecules, and they're down here. And you can arrange them in different ways. And that's one way of understanding glass. But actually, at different scales, so this line in the middle is getting is scales of bigger, 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 bigger if we go into glass. When you look at a pair of glass at the top, well, they just look like transparent objects. As you get smaller, you see there are different features in glass. Now, one of them that I want to talk about is these little holes, so-called defects. And it turned out, when people started to really analyze glass, they worked out that it was made of silicon and oxygen. You could put other stuff in there, uh, like boron. This is the, the so-called uh, Pyrex glass. But they thought, well, hold on a minute. Surely the strength of glass, we want to make big bits of glass. It must be about fiddling down here somewhere. We must be able to get much stronger glass by making much stronger atomic bonds. But it turned out to be completely wrong. It turns out that brittle materials, when you put them under stress, <laughs> they don't flow. They concentrate stress at the defects. And the biggest defect concentrates the most stress. And that is what determines whether it's going to break or not. So if you want to make strong glass, it turns out it doesn't really matter what you do down here. What you need to do is get rid of the big defects. In fact, you need to get rid of almost all the defects. And that was very difficult, because actually the process of making glass in factories to, for buildings and so on usually involved them putting, blowing glass or pouring glass onto a big platen. And the platen itself was very, very polished, incredibly polished. But the most polished thing still has little imperfections in it, and there's dust in the room, and so on. And so those would always detect how strong it was. And so when you look around the architecture of the all the way through to the early 20th century, you don't see big panes of glass because you couldn't make them reliably. They would just fall apart. Because the bigger the pane of glass, the more likely you are to have one defect that will break it. And so it gets harder and harder and harder to make big things that don't have the big defects in. And so they didn't bother because it was too uneconomic. And no one made, no one made anything looking like the shard <laughs> until a guy in England North England, who, Pilkington, realized something, that you could actually get rid of the defects in glass if you didn't pour it onto a metal platen, if you poured it onto something that was atomically smooth. And what was atomically smooth? A liquid. So he started pouring glass onto liquid tin. And if you go to the factories now, there are rivers of glass that travel three or four times the width of this room that go on for a mile. I'm not joking you. And it's a river of tin. And it pours onto the top of it. And that, that moment, was the moment that the skyscrapers were born. That was the moment your life and all the modern buildings full of glass windows really came into being. 
And it was an insight to do with this diagram, to do with scale, how important it is to understand that the more, the, the more fundamental something is down here, doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually fundamental to the material. Materials are a complex set of structures, and every single scale matters. And they all talk to each other. And you need to understand the whole. So then, this insight, which comes in the 20th century, explodes material science. Because then people really get the hang, of not just of understanding how it is the materials work, but how to make new ones. And I just want to kind of talk you through this, because this is like the general diagram that sort of explains quite a lot of the technology around you. And it's got two sides. One is the living side of the, of the diagram, and one is the inanimate side. So you've got animate, inanimate. And on this side over here, you've got living matter. This is the stuff that nature makes. It's material, your material, right? If you've ever had a dead arm, you know that, OK? Um, wood, you know, um, it's a big material. Trees are big. Whales are big, mice, fleas on the mice, hairs on the fleas. As you zoom in further to these different structures, you find that, thanks to lenses, <laughs> that you get um, tissues. And then the tissues are made of single cells. And everything starts from a single cell. And you zoom in further, and you find that those single cells are made of lots of little micro machines and proteins and carbohydrates and, pro and membranes. And the whole system self-assembles. And you zoom right into the middle, and you get DNA. And the DNA codes for these machines Machines code for the cells. Cells make the tissues like your liver, your kidney, your skin. And then all the higher level features follow. You know, you know on this side of the diagram that, it, that, that, that the genes are not define you. That genes are one aspect of you, but they're not the whole of you. You also know that certain proteins are not the whole of you. But if you get some of them wrong, they're really disastrous. You also know that your skin and your hairs, or not hairs, these all don't define you. I, I have to say that. Um, <laughs> what defines you as a person, as a living person, if you were to ask yourself what life is, is the interplay between those structures. Like, you can take the DNA out and put it in a test tube. You can take the machines out. You can take the cells out. But you, you are, you are all of those structures living and talking to each other, self-correcting. So the big insight is this, that steel or bronze or this lead bell, <laughs> we'll deal with that in a minute, these all have all those scales in them. And if you can manipulate the scales, you can change the properties. Just like if you can manipulate scales in biology, you can change behavior, you can, you can cure a disease, you can give someone new faculties. So let's do something about this bell, actually. It's a bit weak. Let's, let's do something about its structure. I'm going to put it in here for a while. This is liquid nitrogen. It's cold. I'm going to let it cool down in there for a bit. Yeah, you cool off. And while you're doing that, um, let's just talk about this side of the thing. So essentially, rockets, cars, phones, if you zoom in, you get little wires. If you zoom in further, you find that there are little, tiny little machines actually inside your phone, which are mechanical machines with feature sizes smaller than the hair of a flea. And these things we can make. And these things tell your phone which way up it is. That's why it changes when you switch it. You zoom in even further, you find Little crystals. And in fact, I spent my PhD working on these crystals. That's actually a picture from my thesis. <laughs> you have to, someone has to look at it one day. Uh, I was worried in my thesis about those big grains, what they were doing, because they grow inside the material. If you heat up the material that I was studying, which is a super alloy for, for jet engines, they grow. We wanted them to grow, but not all the time. The colors around it show you that the boundaries between that crystal and the other crystals they had particular characters, particular molecular characters. And it turned out that, depending on those characters, this thing would grow or not grow. So understanding crystal structure, understanding how they grow, this is crucial not just to how jet engines work, but it's crucial to all metals. 
And if you look around you and all the, all the cars and the rockets around you, a lot of it boils down to understanding how crystals behave inside them. If you change the size of those crystals, you change the strength of the metal. But why, you might ask, why, if actually metals are made of crystals, that is what you said, isn't it? Why, why do they not shatter when you hit them with a hammer? Because, you know, crystals are brittle. Well, that's this scale down here. This is what inside of crystals look like. And you see little lines. Now, this, these things are called dislocations. They're little defects inside the crystal. And these move around. And they transfer bits of the crystal from one side to the other. So when you hit something, or you bend something that's made of metal, you are changing the shape of those crystals. But you're doing it in the speed of sound, as fast as those little defects will move. So if you can stop those things moving, you can change metal's ability to be ductile. You can make it stronger. You can make it weaker. It's like a, whole, a lot of material science is about fiddling with these little micro scales. So for instance, this bell here is made of brass. And <laughs> it's got a ring to it, right? Now, the reason it's ringing so loudly is because inside the crystals of this zinc copper alloy, there are little loads of dislocations in there, but they aren't able to move very well. And because they're not able to move, there's nothing, there's not much for the sound to absorb. So the energy of the sound just goes straight past them because they are not moving. But in lead, before that I showed you, well, lead has dislocations that move really easily and other defects that move really easily. And so a lot of the sound I was trying to put into the material was being absorbed by them moving in real time. So if you could stop them moving, they wouldn't be able to absorb the energy, and that bell would ring. Right? That's a prediction. <laughs> Let's put it to the test. Now, why would cooling something down stop dislocations moving? Well, they're made of atoms, and atoms have to vibrate and have space to move. And actually, when you cool things down, you contract them. And that means that dislocations, it turns out, can't move very easily. And it's also why, when things do get cold, they generally get weaker. And that, hopefully, is why this bell is going to perform to you. <laughs> hear ye, hear ye! <laughs> Dislocations exist. Unbelievable, but true. <laughs> so that's the, it's of trivial power, but it is one we glorify in, the material scientists, because it's alchemy. It really is alchemy. Because you get this about different materials, and now lots of things open up that are kind of bonkers. And let me show you one. Let's go to the visualizer. I'm going to talk about this structure. That is a nickel titanium aluminium alloy. You can't see it yet. There it is. It's in the shape of a paperclip. It's a piece of metal. All right, if I extend it, it does what metals do doesn't shatter, it just remains where I put it. It's a ductile metal. But I can jog its memory as to what it used to be like, because when I changed it, lots of little structures change shape inside the material. And I can get them to go back the other way by doing something that's called a phase change. I can change the structure back pretty much instantaneously. Now that, that is a clever metal. And you have it in every one of your kitchens. I guarantee you, it's in your kettle. That's what turns your kettle off. Something amazing as that in what you might regard as something mundane. What's also the real um, pity of this is that when your kettle dies, and usually that's 18 months to two years, I think you'll find, <laughs> you'll throw this away and no one will recover it. And that I'll get to a bit later. But just to kind of say that you know, this is a jet engine alloy, which has also got incredible engineering of metal alloys in it. 
And when you go on a plane flight, this is heated up to about 1,200 degrees. And it's whizzing round at an enormous rate, huge stress. And if it breaks, everyone dies. <laughs> and it doesn't break. And it goes back and cross across the Atlantic and back across the Atlantic. And, and it makes flights reliable, safe, and cheap. And you don't notice it either. <laughs> But it is an incredible achievement. So can I just go back to the slides and just finish up this part and say this, that I've given you a flavor of how material science works. It's this insight, which was born of glass and lenses, that everything has structure in it. And that, you know, the handlebars and this stage and your clothes and Everything, all the metals and ceramics and glasses, they all have these structures in it. And if you can fiddle with them at the right scale, you can make them stronger. You can make something like a shard. You can make something like a phone. You can make something like a car, a rocket. You can make a jet engine. You can make a paperclip that <laughs> does amazing things. You can make a kettle. Your life is full <laughs> of stuff that came out of this insight. And we have got really, 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 really good at it. <laughs> And if you want any evidence of how good we are at it, the smartphone, if you have one in your pocket, is sort of the epitome of it. But what do I mean then when, why can material science save us from ourselves? Because it sounds like the story I'm telling is one of just triumph, unalloyed, or in fact, alloyed <laughs> triumph. Sorry. Um, OK, so that, this is. Um, this is the other side of the coin. So this is a picture depicting Goethe's poem, uh, which is called The Sorcerer's Apprentice. And it depicts an apprentice who is told by the sorcerer to clear up the lab while he goes off for a walk and wash it and that sort of thing. And he gets a bit bored, so he casts a few spells, and he tries to get the lab to clear itself up and to wash itself. And he doesn't quite have enough skill. And so the whole lab just ends up in anarchy until the sorcerer returns and restores order. And you might say, well, in some senses, this is where we are with material science. We have a lot of power, no doubt, but we don't quite know really how to use it. And I'm going to illustrate that with a few examples. OK, so I came into the building. You all came to the building. You saw this incredible stuff. It's got all these materials in it. I, I, I pointed out the mace, you know, this gilt object. It's incredible. But if someone had walked into that building 30 years ago, this building, 30 years ago, they would have walked past the mace with no interest. They would have gone up to the liquid crystal display and gone, oh my god. That is an incredible thing, that flat panel display. What is it? It's incredible. It's, it's just this amazing piece of tech. We live in a, in a science fiction world. We have just, over the last 30 years, exploded technology in all of our lives. But that complexity has a cost. And I just want to show this little film that I made that just sort of explain. Uh, this is in the case of, a, of another type of, uh, is that going to work? No, hold on. There we go. There's lithium and cobalt in the battery, lanthium and yttrium in the screen, terbium and dysprosium make the microphone, there's even arsenic in the silicon chip. Each element has a unique role to play, making our phones slimmer, smarter and more powerful. What that shows you is, sorry, if I go back just a little bit, oh, no, I don't want to do that. There. That is a picture of the periodic table. All the elements we know exist, there's roughly around 100 or so. You have half of them, more than half, in your pocket if you have a smartphone. So we've managed to kind of discover all these materials, all these different elements, put them all together in something very, very complex. You can phone anyone in the world. You can get data from anyone in the world. You can get real-time video from a taxi. Um, and yet, and yet, you know, they only last 18 months. That's pr approximately there kind of lifespan. 
And um, at the end of them, they're, they're just sort of disposed of. Right? They're, they're, these materials are not extracted. There's only one material that is extracted, and that's the gold. There's 300 times more gold in a kilo of smartphones than a kilo of gold ore. So we've done this amazing thing, right? We are sorcerers. <laughs> this is a piece of magic. But we don't quite know what to do at the end of life of it. And you, know, you might think, well, OK, we'll, we'll get the hang of it. Come on, we've only just started. But and a lot of economists tell me this as I, when I expressed and have, I've done programs about this. And I say to them this, OK, if we can't get the hang of plastic, right, what chance have we got the hang of something as complex as a mobile phone? Like, we are, we are incredibly in command of lots of resources of the world, but we're also a bit dumb about them. And it's, it's a real, well, it's more than a tragedy, isn't it? This is, at the current rate of plastic entering the ocean, it will have more plastic in it than fish in 2050. Now, plastic is a great material. So for me, as a material scientist, this really, really pains me. And I, first of all, I think the material science community has to own up to this problem. It's our problem. It's not anyone else's problem. Okay? And, well, it is everybody's problem. But, you know, we really, really have to be involved in the solution of it. And I want to kind of sort of work through why something as simple as just a piece of packaging has ended up with like this. And therefore, what might happen in terms of mobile phones if we don't really think about this? OK, so this is my uh, preferred view of looking at something like a piece of plastic packaging, like for your milk, if you had some this morning. This is high-density polyethylene, HDPE. It's made from little ethylene molecules down here. They, they're polymerized into big chains. That's a really smart piece of chemistry. That gives you a material that is partly crystalline, i.e. it's very regular, and partly amorphous, which means it's random. If you can change the, very, the combinations of those two structures, you change the strength and toughness of the material. But it being just made of carbon and hydrogen, it's very light. So you can have four pints of milk in a very small amount of material that is tough. You drop it on the floor, it won't break pretty much all the time. Um, and that's not true of the, the material it replaced, glass. <laughs> um, and it's much, much lighter than glass, 10 times lighter than glass. But it has an Achilles heel. It is very recyclable. If you were to put the, all those milk bottles back in, you would get a material you can make new, new milk bottles out. People do try and do this. But you'll notice that the, the top is colored. Now, the top is still made of high-density polyethylene, but when those tops go into the recycling, they change the color slightly. And that color is rejected by the supermarkets. And they reject it because they say that you reject it. And you reject it <laughs> because off-colored milk is not appealing. And it's as simple as that. And so the recycling doesn't happen. Because that, to clean it up, to get it white, 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 costs much more money than just taking oil and making fresh polymer. And so that's what happens. People say that stuff is recycled. What they mean is it's collected and shipped to other countries. That's, that is the reality. Now, why is it shipped to other countries? Because other countries have people who will sort it for much less money. And so it's worth something there. But then even there, it's not that worth money. So it ends up, a lot of it, in the sea. Can we go to the visualizer? I just want to do one more thing. Because as you noticed on my journey through this building, I picked, I picked up, up a piece of paper. paper and and um, I, said, I said, that's, that's an amazing, amazing material. material. I want to just contrast, contrast this. this. So here, here is some tomato that you, you might get. get. I did, I did get, get. <laughs> from, from the supermarket. supermarket. Oh, oh I've mean, got an echo. Is that better? better? Um, OK, here, here, here's some tomatoes. Now, this is from Thanet Farm. This is, these are British tomatoes. There's every reason to be proud of buying them, right? It's locally produced, essentially. It, it's in a packaging that actually is very lightweight. It's not using a lot of energy to get it here and has really protected them rather brilliantly. Not just that, though. Because of its transparency, this packaging, I'm pleased with this product. I think it's nice, nice and clean. It is clean. <laughs> now, I'm going to give you the alternative, which Many of you this room remembered buying tomatoes like this. Okay? We used to buy tomatoes like this. This was how we bought them. Someone, a local person, would say, how many do you want? But in a really booming voice, tomorrow's, tomorrow's. No, that's not exact, that's exactly not the voice. Sorry. I thought I was going to be able to pull it off. I can't. Okay. And then I'd ask, and then you get some, right? And then you take this home, and that, that, that paper bag would end up 
in the bin, it's true, probably, but it would then not end up polluting things too badly, you say, because you know, it just gets wet and then just becomes cellulose fibers and then bacteria get it. It's biodegradable, it's the point I'm trying to make. So, which is better? That's the question we really need to answer as a society. <laughs> Paper, on the one hand, looks a good solution to go back to, but the problem with it is it's actually very energy intensive and water intensive to make. So when you throw this away, the one use, you're throwing away a lot of energy, and that energy has to come from somewhere, and at the moment it comes from oil, or it comes from renewables, but even then it's very expensive energy, and you don't want to be throwing it away. This packaging, on the other hand, has protected it, so it's, it's, it actually arguably will reduce, reduce waste of food much more effectively. You also, and I'm saying this to you because it's us, we like this more. And if you question that, is that supermarkets, if they're good at one thing, they're good at <laughs> giving us what we want. We choose this over this. That's what we've done. And we've done it for reasons that are aesthetic. And so what the supermarket has done is, you want that, we're going to reduce the cost. We're going to really, really Make, reduce the cost of our wastage. So we're going to make these amazing materials right, to package them in. Unfortunately, of course, because of this top layer, it's unrecyclable. Okay? And even the bottom layer, although theoretically recyclable, is very rarely recycled. You have two different materials. They're a mixture, a bit like the colors. If they go in together, you're done. No one wants to unseparate them, not economically anyway. So ah, uh, really annoying, right? <laughs> OK, now I'm going to take a chance. I'm going to tell you my solution to this problem. This is new, everyone. This is. What you want, really, I think, is <laughs> not this, but something like this, OK? This is going to be, I, mean, I haven't got a name for it yet, it's going to be the shipping container of vegetables, OK? It's going to be a standard size, right? All vegetables will come in it. And because it's standard, all automation systems will handle it. All lorries will handle it. All supermarket shelves will handle it. And because it's standard and it's kind of substantial, it won't get thrown in the bin because it's got a use. <laughs> it's got a very clear use. And so you'll hand these back, right? And then they'll get filled with more vegetables. And there is no waste there, right? There's no waste. And in fact, if you look at shipping and what's happened to it with the shipping container, <laughs> What's happened is that someone invented a system that everyone could sign up to and actually decreased an enormous amount of packaging waste. Is it possible for this to do this? And the answer is no, because I think you would reject it. All of you are now in your heads going, no, but. I haven't thought of this. Oh my god, I thought he's intelligent, but that has just shown me that he's not. And I thought those things too, let me just tell you that. This is how ideas start, okay? The first prototype. And if it's not this, we need something better than this, but we need something soon. And we all need to get involved with whatever this thing is, because whatever this thing is, we all have to use. <laughs> so I've given you some homework there to try and think of something better than this, because if the current solutions don't work. And I'll show you why they don't work um, in this next slide, if we go back to the slides. OK, paper is a good material, but I don't think it's the packaging material we want. And this is the reason, right, that actually when you look at energy generation and usage and then you look at CO2 emissions, we have a big problem coming and it's called global warming. And we have to cut this diagram at least by half, at least, soon. But it's very hard to find out ways of, of doing that which don't change your lives quite radically. And one of the ways is about, is about usage. So if you go to a packaging material that re increases food waste, what happens is that the, the agriculture component of CO2 emissions is going to go up. And the energy generation component is going to go up. So you, 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 you lose in one hand and you gain in another. So whatever we do, we can't move towards a situation where you get more food waste. And nor what can I say, can we keep with the status quo? So here's the other thing. That if we're going to really do something about this diagram, there's another material we need to change, which we're using rather a lot of, which is meat. Now, meat is a very convenient way to change this diagram. If we all went vegetarian, it would have a massive impact on this. I mean, about 10%. And 10% may not sound a lot, but 10% is a huge, it's a huge impact. And um, 
When you, when you factor in land use changes, things like deforestation, it's more than 10%. So will we do it? Will we give up meat? Will the 10 billion people who are coming also give up meat? Unlikely, really unlikely, isn't it, that we will just do that overnight? So what choice do we have? What, as a mature scientist, could you do? Well, you could invent something that would be less CO2, have less CO2 emissions than meat, but be as delicious. Right? If you could do that, you could have a massive impact on this. You could invent a new material, an edible material, a meaty material, right? <laughs> Impossible, you say. And stop fiddling with our food system. I don't want you to fiddle with it. I don't want some artificial food. I really don't want that. That is not the solution, Mark. Back away from that solution. OK, why I think it is the solution, or one we should take very seriously is, of this next demo, which we're all going to do together. And it involves eating chocolate, a completely synthetic material, right? made of vegetable product, but invented by humans, highly engineered. And if you haven't had it, this is going to be the moment that's going to transform your views of it and of the prospect of making artificial meat as good as this. So what we've got here is some chocolate pieces. It's 70% lint, dark chocolate. And what I, need, what I need everyone to do in a minute, I'm going to give about two minutes, is to, is to get a piece of this. But don't put it in your mouth yet. I want, I, I want that moment where we're all putting chocolate in our mouths together. <laughs> Just for that reason alone. No, but I want to talk you through some things. You know, we really, as a society, we really need to make a push for this. And, I, and I'm using chocolate as, an, as a success case, right? So chocolate is an artificial material. It's made by material science. There's material science professors of chocolate all around the world. And I want, I'm going to take you through what's in it when you put it in your mouth. So at one point, in a moment, I'm going to ask you all to put it in your mouth, put it onto your tongue and just leave it there, and I'll talk you through what's going on in your mouth, OK? Everyone ready for this? Ready, steady, in the mouth. OK, great. Now, first of all, it, tastes, it feels a bit like plastic, actually. It's hard, right? Maybe it's been in your hand too long. But then your tongue is now speaking to it, isn't it? And it's speaking to it in the language of thermodynamics. It's actually giving it a little bit of warmth. But then something is starting to happen. Hold on a minute. There's some warmth there, but now there's a bit of coolness coming in. Where's that coming in? Is it from the window? Is the window open? No, it's not the window. It's actually that the crystals inside the chocolate are melting. And they're melting. They're grabbing energy from your tongue. And in order to melt, that's when something grabs energy from something else, you feel cool. And that's what's happening. But the result of that cooling is not what you might expect. Something cold in your mouth, it's quite the opposite. It's something warm and gooey in your mouth. Your brain is exploding. <laughs> but you haven't even got to the chemical bit. This is just thermodynamics. And that's one of the wonderful things about chocolate, is that it cools your mouth, but fills it with warm gloop. And it makes your brain go, this can't be happening. It's impossible. <laughs> I am loving this. It feels, to many people, like a kiss, in a way, right? It's a kind of great kiss. And it gets better, because now what should be happening on your tongue is that because the crystals have melted, and these are fat crystals, by the way, and don't be ashamed of that, it's delicious fat. Um, the fat is called cocoa butter, and it's melting now. And now it's releasing this matrix of other stuff that's in there that came originally from the cocoa bean, but was kind of, you know, it was the mechanism that how that plant reproduces itself. But then it was fermented, and that produced all sorts of esters and fruity things. And then it was roasted, and that's given it something called the Maillard reaction. So that's given it lots of kind of nuttiness and chocolatiness and roasted umaminess. And then someone has rather brilliantly, I think, added some sugar. <laughs> and that is also starting to now dissolve in the, your saliva, which is loving this, by the way and reproducing lots of stuff. And the saliva is hitting your sweet receptors, which are just going off like bilio. But also, those clever people from Lint have added a little bit of salt. And that's also hitting your salt receptor. And now your receptors are going, oh my goodness, I'm getting umami, I'm getting salt, I'm getting sugar. What is this stuff? It's like meat, but it's not meat. 
is kind of what it's saying. And then it's sort of saying, why isn't it meat? And it says, you know why it's not meat? Because it's melting, and meat doesn't melt. Only there is some of that really amazing Kobe beef that does that, isn't there? <laughs> now, you see where I'm coming with this, is that what we have created is a taste sensation with lots of different processes, lots of a huge amount of engineering, actually, which is all for your delight, right? All of that is just for your delight. No one eats chocolate for nutrition. <laughs> well, in the afternoon, about three or four in the afternoon, I think Zoe and the crew will, uh, <laughs> will you know, recognize that I do often have chocolate, and that has been a bone of contention in the past. Um, so um, where does all that come from, all that deliciousness? It's this control of structure. Here are the triglycerides, which is the fat that, you've, that, that gave you the latent heat effect. Here are, here are these kind of these layers of different crystal types, right? With type five, which is, which is giving you, um, gave you the initial brittleness and then gave you this sort of lovely warmth. The, this blue slide here shows you all the different components, the nuttiness, the sugars, the, 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 um, the results of the fermentation and the, and the roasting. And together, it's a multi, right? It's a, it's a multi-sensorial experience. And, and I think you'll agree with me that it's worth it, right? It is worth it. And I think if we can do that with chocolate, we can do it with meat. We really just have to put our minds to it. And we can really have a completely different diet, but no less delicious. Not I'm saying that vegetarian diet isn't delicious, or even vegan diet. I've got myself into a problem there, haven't I? OK. <laughs> so to just wind up this, that you know, what we can't do, we're, we're living in a very complex world with edible materials and non-edible materials and mobile phones and plastics. And, and, and airplanes, and, we, and, and all of those things have an effect on this energy diagram. And we have to really, really think very hard about the power we have. We have this power. We make new materials. We make new technologies all the time now. Um, and we need to start being much more kind of far-thinking, far-sighted about the effects that the, all of that technology is having on the planet and ourselves. And, just to sort of finish up, I mean, as I came through here, I said that that veneer, you know, that's an interesting material and actually is really important for the story. And I meant it, that actually we're moving towards, you know, already the airplanes you fly in are made of carbon. The cars are starting to be made of carbon. Bikes are made of carbon. This stuff called carbon fiber, you can see it here. Um, but down here, we've, we've discovered all sorts of interesting forms of carbon. Graphene, we've got the 2010 Nobel Prize with these nanotubes of carbon. Now, what we're starting to do is, is lightweight vehicles. And that has a massive cost saving in terms of energy and CO2 emissions. But what we haven't done yet is work out what's going to be the end of life of those. We just forget to do it. We get so excited, and we just forget. And we are storing up a massive problem for our, for our, our, our successors. Similarly, solar cells, OK? Let's all do solar cells. It's fantastic. Solar cells are amazing. They are undoubtedly at least half of the solution to weaning ourselves off fossil fuels. And it's all about understanding how photons of light hit molecular, molecular assemblies down here and turn it into an electric, electric charge, gathering the light, different types of array. But I put it to you, we really do not want to be displacing food uh, and agricultural land for this stuff. We need to find a much smarter way of deploying this stuff. And that means thinking about all these, you know, not just, not just down here at the small stuff, but the big stuff too, and getting the people who, who do the big stuff, getting them involved in the conversation. Which brings me to sort of my final point, which is that the way to save ourselves, right, from all of these calamities that are coming towards us is that material science needs to now, having been very kind of closed in a way, and, and only kind of including chemists and physicists and biologists, it needs to be really big. It needs to get everyone involved. It needs to get architects involved, gardeners. It needs to get chefs, psychologists. It needs to get economists involved. It needs to get makers involved. It needs to get everyone who is part of the whole society, because we all rely on this stuff. We're wearing it. It surrounds us. We use it. We love it. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I love it too. But actually, we really need a step change in the way that we are our attitude towards end of life of all of these products. And the way that we've been doing that at the Institute of Making, 
And the reason we started it was to do this, was to say it's not enough actually to sit in your lab and invent new materials that are incredible, and they are incredible, or just to understand things so brilliantly and then just sort of sigh. It actually, <laughs> actually have to get out and change the world. And to get out and change the world, you have to involve the public. You have to talk to the public. And that's why you know, we as a team do incredible open days where thousands of people come. And we have a materials library which shows you all the materials that we've made, well, not all of them, but you know, this enormous am amount of materials that are out there and lets people own them. Like, these are theirs. These are all of ours. But we need to kind of have a place where those people can collaborate together. And when a new material comes along, we're not thinking 20 years later, oh my goodness, what's going to happen at the end of its life? Have we got any idea? <laughs> no, we're not going to be thinking like that anymore. We cannot think like that anymore, because that is why all the plastic is in the ocean. And it may be this solution. It may be, come on, it might be a little bit. It might be. The Miodovnik fruit container. It's everywhere. Good thing he standardized it for the good of everyone. Or something like that. Um, and yeah, as you're walking out today, you know, yeah, look up and see this amazing place that we've made and see all these incredible materials and have a look at your phone and see who's missed not called. <laughs> And then think, yeah, this is an incredible world we've built. We, have re we should be really proud of ourselves. And material science should definitely be proud of itself because it has really been the difference. But we have got so much more to do. And I hope that all of you will be involved in that. I really, really do. So that's the end. I just want to say thanks to so many people uh, who've allowed me to be uh, who I am. <laughs> um, uh, I sort of swore I wouldn't be an academic unless I really enjoyed it. <laughs> and um, somehow that has been allowed to happen. And you know, there are people at the Institute making, you know, you're celebrating me now and I'm really grateful. Uh, and the minute I'm gonna get a medal, I'd be even more grateful for that. <laughs> but I wanna just say the Institute making, that you, you as a team, I just love you all. And you are, you know, we, we've done it all together. And I, I, that is, I, I, I just am so proud of. Uh, but not just that, UCL has been a great place. My family, of course, you know, one, no one can do anything without great support and family. Um, material science community, the BBC have allowed me to make loads of programs on material science. <laughs> I think the first ever. And, then, and, and I, you know, there, there are lots of people, producers in this room, who took a chance on me and, and, and said yes. And I'm really grateful because I think we got, we got a lot of science out there, entertaining. And Penguin and, and the books that I produced and the science community and, of course, the Royal Society and many, many more people Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Yes, yes. Yeah.